You're listening to the Based on History podcast. Howdy, everyone. Just a quick message for everybody who listens to the podcast. Um, I just want to let y'all know that the promotions that I do for certain people and certain companies, um, I don't get paid for those promos. I do them because those are my friends, those are my family, and I like the opportunity to be able to help them out and support their small businesses. And however big or small the audience is, if I can help them in any way, I'm I'm glad to do it. But I don't want ads to be this super, super long segment in front of my podcast. So I've got a few, uh, I got about four that I do now. And I will probably start rotating between them, maybe two each episode. So those of you that I'm doing promos for, don't worry, still going to do them. But just so that people who are listening to the episode don't have to listen to, you know, seven minutes of ads before you get to the get to the episode. I'm going to start breaking it down, just doing probably two per episode from from now on. Um, yeah, I just want to give you a little shout out, a little update on that. And we'll dive into the episode. This episode is brought to you by Alexis Night Photography. Alexis is an award-winning lifestyle, brand, and wedding photographer based in the Cotswolds, England, specializing in headshots, family shoots, and event photography. Alexis has over 20 years experience. You can find her work and contact her for all your photography needs at alexisknight.co.uk. That's Alexis, K-N-I-G-H-T, Dot co dot uk. This episode is brought to you by Freeman Cooperative. Freeman Cooperative is a small batch independent brand of outdoor goods, equipment, and apparel for the wild and adventurous soul. Inspired by God's expansive outdoors and those who refuse to be tamed, Freeman Cooperative pushes against the tide and rejects all boundaries. We choose creative over cautious, bespoke over common, and divergent over acceptance. Based on History Podcast listeners, please enjoy code one shot one kill for 15% off of your entire order. Freeman Cooperative is a company started by my good friend Mark, and we serve time in the sniper section together. He is a great man, good father, good friend, and I have looked at his website. He's got some really, really good stuff out there for y'all to go and take a look at. Um, I'm Extremely proud to be able to give him a little advertising for the company, however small however small that is. But everyone listening, go take a look at the website. Go take a look at his stuff. He's got some he's got some really, really good stuff. So Mark, I appreciate all the support you've given me. Um just keep it coming. Uh anytime you message me about an episode, uh it always makes me feel uh reinvigorated for doing the podcast. And I, I always uh, enjoy talking to you, and, and we're going to catch up soon, bud. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the Based on History podcast. And for this episode, we kind of have a special rendition of the Things John Got Wrong segment of the podcast. And as you'll hear later on as the episode continues, uh, this was a special episode because um, as I was doing my research and, and preparation uh, to record, record the episode, I post things on the Based on History Instagram feed to help promote it, get people excited for the upcoming episode, things like that. And I was posting some things about uh, 13 hours, and I was contacted by uh, Dave Benton, who goes by Boone, and, and he's one of the men who was actually there uh, that night, and he messaged me. And he said, hey, some of the things that you, you're posting aren't 100% correct or you got this wrong and, you know, and this is actually how it was and things like that. And I really appreciated um, him reaching out to me. I've never had somebody – I mean, a lot of the, the episodes I've done have been way, way in the past. But I've never had somebody contact me who was actually there, who actually lived it, um, reach out to me to help me make sure that I get it right. And so with this one – I did more preparation, read some things that he said, looked at some things that he said. 
to and then uh, recorded the podcast. And then he asked me and uh, to send him the podcast so that he could listen to it and then give me more feedback so that I could fix some of the things that I got wrong when whenever we were recording or things I didn't know that he could explain and, and uh, go about it that way. So for this episode, the things John got wrong is going to be beforehand. So the things I'm about to talk about just kind of keep in mind as you're listening and you say, oh, okay, well, he, he said this in the episode, but he talked about it before, so that's what, actually what he meant or ho- however it may be. But um, some of these things, I'm just going to uh, read them verbatim and then just kind of elaborate a little bit about it uh, so that you kind of understand when you get to certain points in the episode a little bit better how I should have said it or what it's actually um, uh, meant, meant to be. So... We'll just start that um, one of the things about this event that there's a lot of confusion from the media and the you know political powers that be and the information that they've put out and things like that. And one of the things that uh, Dave sent to me was, he just said, there's so many misunderstandings about the movie, the agency, the Department of State, and what people think or believe. And then he goes on to recommend some things in order to read to give you a clear understanding of, of what actually happened. He said, the select committee report is the first thing people should read. Then Benghazi, Know Thy Enemy, which is the book that Dave and Sarah Adams just uh, released. And it's a cold case investigation into these events, the people that planned them, funded it, and carried it out. Fire Alarm, then read the 13 Hours book a book called Under Fire, and then you watch the movie, and you'll get a much clearer picture of, of, of the true events. And then some of the things I talk about, as you know, are big things that the movie gets wrong, and then some of the things I talk about are kind of what I call nitpicky things. And a few of these things pop up in the movie, and one of them is a scene where they're buying back some weapons so they can track them back to their cache or, or wherever. And... There's two guys providing Overwatch, and one of them is in a room with his barrel sticking out of the window. And Alexis asked me about it, asked me about it, and I say, you know, that would never happen. He's a trained sniper. You know, you would never do that. And um, I, and then Alexis asked me if I asked him about it specifically, and I said no, but I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't do that. And so he messaged me back to say, uh, he said, just to confirm a few things that popped up during the episode, that you're exactly right about the barrel. The barrel would not protrude out of an urban hide unless it was a protective mission where that was a visual defense. I'm pretty sure that the weapons buyback scene you mentioned didn't even happen. But what they do is they use things like that to fill in for what they were actually doing in, in, in real life. He said, scene didn't happen. We weren't tracking weapons or buying back weapons in general. But there may have been a particular weapon that we would track or buy back. The black market was already flooded with all these weapons from the Civil War, and they weren't concerned with just a few AKs or a few other weapons of that nature. Uh, As you know, I usually talk about the equipment and weapons and things like that, and I I still will do an episode of weapons, armor, things like that in the movie. Um, That's kind of a mini episode. But one of the things, there's a few of them, that wear those kind of plastic gunfighter helmets. If you ever served in the military, you know exactly which ones I'm talking about. They're the ones you see in the movies that they think look cool, but they're just plastic. And I talk, I talked about that in the movie, and I just said, I'm not sure if they did in real life, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. And uh, Dave messaged me back and said, no plastic were used operational. And then he, he let me know that... So Sarah Adams, who is the co-author with Dave in Benghazi, Know Thy Enemy... I referred to her in the episode as a case officer, which is incorrect. I don't know all of the correct titles uh, for the CIA and and what they actually mean. I use that as a general term, which was incorrect. So she is a targeter. So I want to make sure I I get that right because Dave refers to her as Sarah Superbad Adams. So I want to make sure I get her title right. She's a targeter, not a case officer. The other thing I discuss and is discussed in the movie and in the book is the CIA annex and how secret was it really and and who knew it was there and what you know who if anybody knew what they were doing and things like that and sometimes it's kind of confusing if you just watch the movie and you're like okay well they refer to it as not so secret or but then at the times they're doing all this stuff to keep it secret 
And Alexis and I talk about that a little bit, and I just wasn't super confident on all of that. And um, Dave messaged me and says, the annex wasn't a secret. He said, how do you hide a compound in the middle of a neighborhood that, that has been there for years? You hide it in plain sight. He said, most of the locals thought the annex was part of the State Department special mission compound, and state would come over and visit us often as we would visit them as well. And so what they're doing is they know that they can't conceal this massive compound with white Westerners walking in and out of it. What they can do is camouflage the reason for them being there by associating themselves with the State Department so that people believe that they're not CIA, not running these covert missions, but they are part of security of the State Department and they're they're there for the ambassador and, and things of that nature. That still may not be 100% correct, but that just gives you a little bit better idea of how they use the hiding in plain sight, you know, method. And he also said that uh, I talk about what the CIA is doing there, the reasons for them being there. And I use the book and the movie as kind of just that kind of general information that they're doing, collect, you know, tracking weapons, counter uh, terrorism, things like that. And Boone says that the agency was not collecting counterterrorism in Libya. And there's a couple more things that he talks about the purpose of the CIA there and the purpose of GRS within the agency and things like that. And I take it all to mean that we will never know. That information of what they're really doing in Libya will, will never be known to us. And you know what? It's a CIA. That's fine. I, I don't need to know all of the specifics about what their mission in Libya was. And he goes on to say that they, they use those things like the counterterrorism and the weapons traffic tracking and things like that to represent things that they would or could have been doing in Libya for to film the day to day operations for the movie and, and the book. But we'll never know what they what they were really doing. Another thing that I, as I began to do research and I, when I first saw the movie was, I was like, what is GRS? What is their role? What do they do? And, and, and my initial thought was they are a top tier private contracting agency that's been hired by the CIA, but that was completely wrong. And, and I still don't think I have a hundred percent grasp on what they fully do, but, but Boone and I have talked about it, uh, you know, back and forth a little bit about what GRS purposes, what they were doing with the CIA, what they do for the CIA in conjunction with them and, and things of that nature. And he said, people confuse GRS and what, and what it is and is not. They have nothing to do with physical security of the compound, and they are not a separate organization or contracting company from the agency. They are a specialized unit within the agency. Some are staffers and some are direct contractors for the agency. So that kind of gives you a very, a much clearer picture of what GRS does. And to kind of that same degree of we'll never know what the CIA was doing in Libya. We'll, we'll never know what their, what the missions they were doing. And, and that's all, you know, top secret classified information. And, and, and that, and that's, that's fine. The other thing that gets talked a lot about, and we talk about it in the episode as well, is, is the stand-down order. You see it very clearly in the movie. It's talked about in the book. And then afterwards in the investigations by Congress and things of that nature, they talk about this stand-down order a lot. And th this is what Dave sent to me about, about the stand-down order. He says, the stand-down order gets thrown around a lot and is confused with other events that happened. In an incident in the past, Bob said, word for word, stand down, you're not the first responders. But he never said that to us that night, and apparently only said it to TIG that night. Now, he and our staff, TL, did delay us and give us false information. One key point people don't understand is that Bob never had the authority to tell us to stand down, and we explained that to him in the past, but he did delay us along with our TL. So, that, that's a first-hand account of that incident happening and you hear the other GRS members talk about it in interviews and things like that and when it was said who it was said to other things that were said that essentially are a delaying order that prohibited them from leaving when they initially wanted to and I kind of already hit on it earlier about things we'll never know some things but Dave sent me this message as well which I think kind of 
just kind of clears it up a little bit even more. So because of the nature of what the GRS does within the agency, some things will remain classified and not clear, along with what the agency's role was, but we were there with the full knowledge of the Libyan transitional government. So I I think he sent that to me in reference to I I said was talking about the CIA and it was covert and they you know they kind of they weren't supposed to be there and things of that nature. So that helps clear up so it just gives us a little bit more information um about I guess the knowledge of the Libyan government and them being at the annex. One of the one of the things one of the last things he sent me um I think it is really good to keep in mind when you're when you're watching the movie or or reading the 13 hours book. And he said, just keep in mind, the movie is an expression of some of the actual events that took place that night, but not a play by play of what actually happened and and why. In some scenes, like the weapons buyback, is just an example of what our day to day lives may have been like. And so that just kind of goes back to what I've been talking about a few times in that a lot of this stuff is classified. It will always be classified. And they have taken things that could have been done by them to fill in for the movie, to make it a coherent story, and to show a thing that they could could have been doing. But just for the book and the movie purposes, not to say this is in actuality what they were doing. So those are the things that he that he sent me. I'm sure I still got some things wrong in the episode. Um, and, and if he comes back to me with, with more things, um, then I will, <laughs> then I'll, I'll put those in, in the, in the next one and, and go into more detail about, uh, all the other things that I, that I got wrong. Um, so I, I say in the podcast, but I'll, I'll say it again here before the episode, uh, gets started. I just want to say a big thanks to Dave for all the help and information that he has given me to help me get a, as right as possible in producing this episode. He didn't have to. Um, and he took the time to help me, which is just a small podcast that I do, um, in my own time. And I just really appreciate all the insight that, uh, that he provided for me. So without further ado, we'll get the, uh, episode going and I, I hope you enjoy it. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're gonna kick him in the ass. We're gonna kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're gonna go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the Based on History podcast. I'm your host, John Nydick. Joining me once again is my beautiful wife, Alexis. Hello. And today we're going to be covering... <clears throat> excuse me. Today we're going to be covering the movie, The 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. And I really like this movie. Um, I remember when it came out, and it really kind of allowed me to kind of start looking into this because I think, with, like a lot of people, you had kind of heard that this event had happened, but there was never very much press, never very much investigation, never very much attention giving given to this. So it's really cool to be able to uh, cover this movie and and talk about uh, and talk about it a little bit. Is there a book about it? Yes, yeah, so the book of the same name is uh, by Mitchell Zukoff, and it mm -hmm. has the same title, and that's, it was my main source of information. So had uh, you, when you watched the movie for the first time, had you read the book at the time? No, but like I said, I didn't even know, I, all I knew that there was an attack that had happened in right. ben, Benghazi, um, and so I read the book a few years ago, and then I, I reread it for this podcast, um, and that was kind of my main source of information, along with, I watched a bunch of interviews from the guys that they, uh, that were actually there, that they gave, 
um, multiple news outlets and in, in regards to the attack and in regards to when this movie came out um, as and the, well. And the guy, the, uh, Mitchell, who wrote the book, mm-hmm. was he was he there or was he no he somebody that he, had I mean I say just he's it. he's an author who decided to uh, write the story and got right. in contact with the men okay. and um, the book as well with the movie focuses on the events of that night kind of you know more or less regardless of politics it's their story it's these the the cia staff and the grs operators that were there Mm -hmm. it's their story about what happened that that Mm -hmm. night um we'll talk a little bit more about the politics at the end and some books that kind of deal with that aspect of it but um we'll kind of get into some of the stuff about the movie and then we'll kind of then after that we'll get into the kind of history of of the uh, uh, the uh, the events. So, what were your you you'd seen this movie before? I'd seen this movie before. Yeah, I had but, seen it before, but I'd kind of forgotten what it was all about. When did it come out? Came out in uh, 2016. Okay. So fairly fairly recent. Yeah, I think I saw it when it came out, um, and I didn't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that it was a true story. I guess it says so it, at the beginning, a, doesn't it? It does yeah, say yeah. this is based on a true story. Yes, yeah. it says this is a true story. Um, right, okay. Uh, uh, right when the movie when the movie starts. Um, um, yeah, what are just some of your initial thoughts rewatching it again? I, I loved it. I thought it was really well done, really good acting, very realistic to me anyway. I don't know that world, but it all seemed very real. Yeah, I think it has, uh, when, when you're comparing movie combat to other movies and things like that, I think, it has a, to me, it has a very, very real feel, and from the way they filmed it, and then of course the way the men move, operate, hold their yeah. guns. It, so you think it was quite accurate in that way? Yeah, well, I, uh, yes, I do. And from a storytelling perspective of them telling what actually mm-hmm. happened, when you read the events of the books to what happens in the movie, it's it's pretty accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also just from the gear they wear to the weapons that they're carrying, how they carry them, how they use them, all of that checks a lot. There, there are some, there are some, <laughs> there are some problems that I have with the movie and the things that they do and how they operate. But we'll, we can, and we can get in, into those. But um, overall, I like the movie. The acting is good. The cast is good. I even and, liked um, the main guy that played Jack, John Krasinski. John Krasinski. I don't normally like him in movies, but I really liked him in this. Yeah, he. This movie came out kind of whenever he was done with the office mm-hmm. and trying to kind of like make a name for him himself. himself yes, yeah, se- yeah, that would be a better way to say it. Separate himself from the office. Mm-hmm. He did the um, Tom Clancy Jack Ryan uh, TV yeah, show. I couldn't watch which, that. <laughs> not that he was bad in it, but I didn't really like it mm-hmm. very much. And, and I remember th- thinking that when I watched this movie and seeing him in it. This is the first time where I watched him in a movie and didn't... I mean, I still thought, oh, there's Jack from The Office. Mm-hmm. but Or Jim from The Office, excuse me. Jim from The Office. But I didn't think of him as Jim from The Office. I thought he did a really good yeah, job. Yeah, he was great. Uh, he, pl- he played the part really well and was very believable in the kind of world that he's portraying from this movie. I thought I thought all the actors did a great job. A lot of them have been in... Military movies. Yeah, I recognize before. Them all from military roles in yeah. movies. Yeah, James Badge Dale, who plays Tyrone Woods in the movie, uh, he was in the the miniseries The Pacific, so he plays yes, uh, really one of the like one of the Marines in the Pacific, and uh, Max Martini, who plays Oz in the movie, mm-hmm. he's been in a ton of military movies. Uh, he was the first one I remember seeing him in. He's in Saving Private Ryan. Okay. I he's him from that. he's one of he it's a small role but he's one of the 101st airborne paratroopers at the end when they find private Ryan, they have the battle at the end to kind of hold that bridge mm-hmm. in that town he's one of the one of the paratroopers what there what about the guy um who played tanto pablo pablo uh, schreiber yeah he's what's he been in cuz i recognize him but i couldn't remember what i'd seen him in um he's i would say he's kind of is he in like a magic mike type of movie uh, I don't think no. he's. Uh, I'm positive he's not in Magic Mike, 
But as far as military movies are mm-hmm. concerned, I know that after this movie, he there was that Halo, the Halo TV show that came out. I haven't seen it, but he right. plays like the main Master Chief guy. Okay. He was in a movie called Den of Thieves, where he plays like an ex Special Forces guy who robs a bank and and things like that. Uh, so they and then you've got uh, David Denham or Denman, excuse me. He uh, plays Dave Benton in the movie. And he's also from The Office as well. And I don't know a whole bunch of other things that he's been in, but I think he does a, a, a I think they all do a great a great job in the movie. Um, and then you've got uh, Dave or David Famusa, I think his name is. He plays uh, John uh, Tigan, who goes by Tig in the movie. He's kind of the tall guy with dark hair. He wears wears glasses. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, the one with twins. Uh, no. I thought he had twins. I mean, he. Well, he may have twins. I, I don't remember. You might be right. Yeah, I think I am. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. We'll put that on the things John got wrong uh, <laughs> portion. Um, the cast is great. Some of the little problems that I have from the movie's perspective is sometimes, you know, the exposition in mil- I've talked about this before. The exposition in military movies sometimes gets me because it's not the way people actually talk. They explain things a little too much sometimes. Right, for our benefit. Yeah, for the for the benefit of the audience, mm-hmm. and they do that a few, not through the whole movie, not through the whole movie, but every once in a while they they'll say something, and I'm like, that that just doesn't. S- well, for you, I guess it you, it's not needed, so it seems unnecessary. But for people like me, it's probably a bit more needed to understand what's going on. Well, see, I I disagree because. When well, when we go back to like Black Hawk Down, mm-hmm. when we covered that movie before, mm-hmm. and there's almost no kind of what I call expositional talking right. in Black Hawk Down. Yeah, but you had to explain to me a lot of what was going on. Some, yeah, but <laughs> it. But from an enjoying the movie's perspective, it doesn't really matter. You're gonna you're watching the movie unfold, right? And, and there's ways to do exposition in movies without the characters saying. You know, verbatim, word for word, explain explain yes, things out. Okay. And and overall, this movie doesn't do that a ton, but there's just a few instances. The other kind of problems I have are, and I I don't know that they they very well could have been using this type of helmet. I do not know, but some of these guys are wearing the plastic helmets that you can see because they've got holes in them, mm-hmm. and those helmets don't do anything other than. Like it'd be like wearing a construction helmet, you know. Right, like okay. it, it might help it's impact. Like the movie we watched last night, they were wearing those as well, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that movie was terrible. But um, so I don't know. Maybe they were. Maybe they were. Mm-hmm. But it, when anytime I see them in a, anytime I see those kind of plastic gunfighter helmets in the movie, to me it, it just seems, not real because, like, these guys are all. Highly trained military vets coming from different backgrounds in the military, they would all have actual helmets. And if they're in, if they're going into combat, they would want an actual helmet over a plastic piece. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't seem, like I said, maybe they were, and just because they're lighter and they just needed to carry their their nods and things like that. So I I don't know. But anytime I see their night vision goggles and things. Yes, yeah, nods. Yes, their their night their night vision. Okay. Um, and. So yeah, that's always just a little bit of a red flag when I see it in movies. Um, and then the other kind of thing is that there's one scene where they're doing that um, that trade. They're trading money for some guns outside of the compound. Mm-hmm. And they've got two snipers in Overwatch overlooking the position. Mm-hmm. And one of the snipers, who his character is Boone, Dave Bitten in the movie... He's in a building, and his rifle is sticking out of the window. And as a sniper, I mean, it's, it's fairly common knowledge now, but, like, you never shoot with your barrel sticking out of the window. You would be back inside the is room. That the, is that the one where the the red kind of curtains y- yes. are blowing over it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, so I mean, that was more of a visual thing. For it's, us, it's, it? it's strictly for the movie to show yeah. people, hey, there's a sniper here. But it's it's bad because I mean, he's a Marine Scout sniper. He is a highly trained 
Sniper. Mm-hmm. So he, he would not be. Doing he he would not be doing that. He mm-hmm. would not be doing that. And anytime I see snipers in movies that have their barrel sticking out of the window, it's just. It's, so, um, it's bad. Because you've been speaking to him in real life, haven't you? Yes. Did he, and he's been telling you some things that the movie got wrong as well, hasn't he? He's been telling me, yeah, so he... Did he mention that? No, I didn't I didn't ask him that specifically <laughs> because I'm, I was just pretty sure as a sniper myself that, like, he was not sticking his barrel out, out, of, the, okay. out, of, the, out of the window. But, um, yeah, so I post some stuff on Instagram promoting the next upcoming episode, and he actually contacted me on Instagram with some of the information that I put out that was wrong and said, hey, some of the stuff you're saying is in, is incorrect. And so I was like, oh, great. And so we kind of started this back and forth dialogue and he was kind of saying, hey, you know, this is actually how it was or this is, you know, who did that or, or things mm-hmm. like that. And we'll get into more of those things that, that I was talking to him about mm-hmm. as we kind of go through the historical events and the, the, the timeline of that night. But it was great to it was great to have somebody reach out to me who was actually there and lived it and give me information that you may not necessarily get from the movie, the book, the interviews that you see or anything like that. Just that insight from yeah. from one of the men that that actually that actually lived. And what's his name? His name is Dave Benton. And and Boone is just a nickname. Bo- yeah, Boone is it's it, one, it's his call sign that he kind of goes by. They all kind of have a, you know, like Tyrone goes by Roan and Tygen goes by Tig and, mm-hmm. you know, Pronto goes by Tonto. They kind of all have those calls, right, <clears throat> excuse okay. me, call signs that, that they go by. Um, and he's the kind of more heavily bearded actor in it. Yeah, so he's, he's played by Dave Denman mm-hmm. in, in the movie, um, who in real life doesn't look anything, anything, no. anything <laughs> like him. But uh, he, I think he does a good job. And he talks about um, he's the one that seems to be a little bit more kind of mature and philosophical on in the movie. Yes, yeah. Um, talks about gods being inside them and <laughs> yes, yeah. And they talk about that in in the book as well. Okay. Him kind of being uh, you know more calm and collected yeah. and and I I haven't spoken to him on the phone or anything like that, but uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to mm-hmm. get it set up to where we can actually talk. So. Um, did they shoot this in Libya, or is it somewhere completely different? <laughs> no, no, because that yeah. is a that is a Talib- Taliban run, no, isn't not it? Tal- or not Taliban? Not, no, not Tal. So ta- Taliban. ISIS or what? I don't know. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get we'll okay. get in we'll get into those groups in, in a little bit. Was it filmed in Morocco? So it was filmed mainly in Morocco okay. and Malta, and okay. Morocco, I think, is where they shot a lot of the like driving around scenes. Mm-hmm. You know, in the city, out of the city, things like that. In Malta is where they rebuilt the the, the CIA annex and the you know diplomatic okay. outpost or the the U.S. Cons- temporary consulate. You know, they, yeah. it's got it's got called all these different names and they all mean different something. And, and that kind of like is a political button of what the designation is and how much mm-hmm. security it should have had and and things like that. And so we'll talk about that when we kind of get to the aftermath mm-hmm. and the reasoning and the political fallout and stuff and stuff like that. But yeah, they rebuilt the compound. For the movie in in, in Malta, um, and as far before we kind of get into the history of it about the movie, I know that the actual men who were there, these GRS op, uh, operators, were heavily involved with the making of the movie. Not all of them, but you really see Oz, Tig, and Tonto on set advising, mm. and uh, Michael Bay, who was the director of this movie brought them in early in in the process to try and make sure they got this movie as right as they could and when i was uh, talking to uh dave about what they got right what they got wrong stuff like that and 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 letting him know kind of where i was getting my information and if it was reliable or and things like that and he said that the movie's about 80 percent accurate as to what happened that that night and then i asked him about the book that the movie's based on and he said the book is more or less 100% accurate as to what happened that night, given the information that they had at the time in which he was writing the book. You know, they didn't have hindsight. The book that we'll talk about later that he wrote with one of the CIA case officers, you know, kind of digs into that hindsight and that background and who the attackers were and why why they why they did what they did. And, and we'll talk about 
talk oh, about okay. that. Okay, because that was one of my big questions from the end of the movie. Yeah. Why? Yep, yeah. When, what their we'll kind of go is. through the timeline of the events, <clears throat> and then we'll go into the aftermath, and mm-hmm. we'll talk about that book, and, and the, you can ask your questions and the reasoning mm-hmm. and, and, and all of that. But so the, the book I, which I read is kind of like my main source from this. And, you know, he was saying as far as the events on the ground and the men and what they did, it's, it's pretty accurate. And the movie about 80 percent. So we'll get in kind of the, some of the change. There's some of it's a little nitpicky, but we'll talk we'll talk about it uh, nonetheless. So now we'll kind of dive into the events that kind of led up to the attack on September 11th in, in 2012. And you have to talk about the kind of the history of Libya and then Gaddafi himself. And Libya this happened in se- on September the 11th. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize. Yep. Hmm. So. Do you think that that was um, planned? Planned. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. For multitude, for a multitude of reasons. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's. It is not a coincidence that the yeah. attack happened on September okay. September the 11th. One because I'll just say it now, but we know now that Al Qaeda had a major hand in planning and funding this operation and September 11th will always be a uh, day that they remember as an important day for us it's a day of memorial and remembering those who died in mm-hmm. the in the towers and in the Pentagon and in that field in, in Pennsylvania for them they it's a celebration of killing Westerners and, mm-hmm. and killing Amer- and killing Americans so it's important for both sides for right. for for different reasons um but when we look at libya and the history of libya it's i mean going back to ancient roman times the romans were in control but the carthaginians were in control and part of it and so they they've they've been handed over from one regime one empire to the next throughout history but when we get kind of closer to modern day libya was in controlled by a royal family much like a lot of the Middle East was. And so you had a, a, a ton of wealth at the top and you know no wealth at the bottom. Then oil's discovered in Libya and really the only ro- royal family and the kind of people at the top are benefiting from the oil industry in Libya. So then we kind of get to Gaddafi and he was born in the early 1940s and entered into the military kind of rose through the ranks and then the 19 so in 1969 he leads a coup against the royal family in in Libya they go into exile it's fairly bloodless because some of them are like out of the country at the time but him and a group of military officers essentially take over the country and form this council called the Revolutionary Command Council or the RCC mm-hmm. and over time that council which is meant to be for the people you know all all that kind of stuff that extreme regimes promise at the beginning of their you know rise to power is there here as well we're going to build more schools we're going to build more dams we're going to you know have more farmland and and stuff like that and and they do do some of those things but throughout the years that kind of command council gets smaller and smaller and smaller until there's kind of a not another coup but another kind of transition of power to where Gaddafi is now the head of state with very little distribution of power below so he's become the king he's essentially the, the king now he he never takes a title like that like I think you know ceremoniously he he was a colonel in the military I think he never like he always retains his colonelcy mm-hmm. rank. You know, it's like this like humble thing that mm-hmm. he does to show that he's still one of the people. But over time, it's very clear that he is the president of Libya and he's a dictator. Over time, Libya becomes one of the most uh, secluded or regulated states in the world. Media is highly, highly re- regulated. I think they said Libya might have been the most media-controlled nation in the world and you see Gaddafi becoming more and more of a dictator and 
the sponsoring of terrorist acts around the world. He sponsors the IRA in Ireland. He is behind or thought to pretty sure to be behind the uh, Pan Am Flight 103 bombing in Scotland, which killed like 200 mm. some odd some odd people. Um, when was that? That was in 1988. Okay. And he sponsors Palestinian terrorist attacks on Israel. Um, uh, I think there was something in Berlin that he that was thought to be behind. So he's not a good guy. And the you know he they starts to bring in more Islamic rule kind of Sharia law things things like that uh, imposing oh, and then it's not 100% because he does encourage women to go to school and 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 does a bunch of things but he is a dictator. And the people at the bottom, the everyday people, are not benefiting from this regime change like they promised in, mm-hmm. in the 60s. And his idea is really kind of pan-Islam. He wants pan-Islam with Libya at the head. So he wants all of the Muslim nations in the world to basically be one empire again. And, I mean, this is not a new idea. There are a lot of people who kind of ha- have this idea. And, but he wants to be the head of it. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't really pan out. So then he kind of transitions to this new ideology of pan-Africanism, kind of North Africa being this one big uh, state empire together with him at the head of it. And that doesn't really excuse me, take control either. So he's becoming more and more secluded. There's embargoes put on Libya, no-fly zones, things like that. And it really kind of comes to a head that's all very general there's a there's a lot more that goes into all of that but just so we can kind of catch up to where where we are in 2011 uh, in february is when the libyan civil war starts and the people rebel against Gaddafi, and they start uh the civil war against him to, to depose him from power 2011 yes 2000. So he must be quite an old man at this point yeah he's he's, he's yeah he was born in the 1940s and he'll he'll mm-hmm. die later on that year in okay. 2011. Um, so NATO gets involved with this civil war um, by claiming that there's crimes against humanity uh, by Gaddafi, and that very well may be true. But regardless, the UN gets involved. The British, the French, and the Americans impose a no-fly zone over Libya, and there's a naval blockade, and they bring their aircraft carriers, so they're launching thousands and thousands of sorties bombing his tanks, his aircraft, you know, military facilities, all all sorts of things in coordination with the rebels who are mm-hmm. taking over over the country. Um, at the beginning of it, he is kind of more or less maintaining control. When the when NATO and then other UN forces kind of get involved, it's over fairly fairly quickly. And then I think by October he is on the run and they they capture him in a construction site and he's in like a uh, drainage pipe and they pull him out and there's there's a they show the video recording of him being pulled out of that pipe at the beginning of the movie and I don't remember that. Uh, I so that. at the beginning of the movie when they're kind of you know <clears throat> um, there's like information being texted uh, on the screen, and they're showing some live footage and of uh, things mm-hmm. like that. And they show this, and they pull him from the from the pipe, and they shoot him. They kind of do a bunch of other things to him. They stab him a whole bunch. They put him on the hood of the car and drive him around. Then they string up his body for a few days, and then he's buried some unmarked grave in in Libya. Wow. So by the by the end of 2011, his regime has crumbled. He is dead, and Libya is now in the process of trying to form a new government. And I would say they're doing a, you know, it's, they're they're struggling to form a cohesive government that can control all of Libya because Libya is a massive, massive country with different groups of people all over. And any time there's a massive regime change in a country, through military conflict, it's going to give rise to different groups of people vying for control. Mm-hmm. And this is when you see these militias pop up 
and terrorist groups start coming to Libya to get a foothold in there. You see Al-Qaeda coming in. There's an Algerian uh, terrorist group that we'll talk about later uh, called AQIM, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Marab, which is kind of North Africa. They kind of start coming into Libya and all these different things. You also see these local militias raiding all of Gaddafi's arms and forts and, you know, uh, all of those types of things for power. And so one of the reasons that the CIA is there is to track the movement of these arms. And they talk about that in the movie and, and show some of that. And then to keep tabs on Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. There's some reports that um, there were some links to Boko Haram, which is another North African mm -hmm. uh, terrorist group with Al-Qaeda affiliation and and doing, doing that kind of work. They're also there in support of, i.e., information gathering to support I, I say US interests, but US interest in helping Libya form this country, which is the reason why Ambassador Chris Stevens is there to show the support of the US to Libya. Um, you know, we can we can right. talk about US politics and what US's true interests are in, in Libya and things like that. But I think Ambassador Stevens himself is there to show support for the new government in trying to form a Republican form of government within within Libya. They everything I've read about him says that he was and they talk about this in the movie as well. He's a true believer in trying to build relations with Libya so that they can move forward mm -hmm. with a representative government to help bring them, you know, help the help the people live not in fear and rebuild right. the country. All, all, all of those right. all of those types of things. So that's kind of why that's kind of why the U.S. is there and the CIA and Christopher Stevens and, and things like that. So you said um, the, they, were, they were tracking the arms, mm -hmm. um, like production and deals that were going on. Um, you know that, fir that scene you were talking about with, the, with Boone's rifle through the window where yeah, they were yes. having that arms deal? Mm -hmm. um, were they, they said something afterwards, you know, that, that really irritating chief... Yes. Um, he had said, I think it was him or it was her, the woman, had said to follow them and, like, blow it completely out. Right. It was that to, like, destroy all the arms? Like, right, yeah. So, she, yeah, so it's, the, the, it's the case officer. I forgot, yeah. I forgot her name in the, in the uh, movie. But um, so they're doing that deal so they can buy those arms from those mm -hmm. arms, arms dealers. And then they're going to follow them back to their hideout or cache, wherever they have all of the other weapons that they've stolen or kept kept in hid. And then they're going to destroy it. Right. Okay. And this is to keep all of these things from getting out onto the black market and then spreading out all over mm -hmm. the world, going to terrorist groups all over the world, and then being used in further terror terror okay. attacks. So they attacks. were doing things like that. That's absolutely quite accurate. Yeah. Absolutely. So that kind of brings us up to where the events of the movie start. Benghazi is one of the most unsafe places in the in the world. There's different factions and different militias, and it's hard to tell them apart. Varying allegiances. They talk about that in the movie. Who's who? We can't mm -hmm. you know, we can't mm -hmm. tell the difference and, and everything like that. So the U.S. embassy and everything like that is in is in Tripoli, which is the capital. Of Libya, and then Benghazi is kind of the other major city mm -hmm. in in Libya, and we'll talk a little bit about the diplomatic outpost that Christopher Stevens is is at. So that's the temporary embassy. Yeah, the, yeah. One. So when when you, it's kind of like embassy, diplomatic outpost. Temporary consulate, you know, there's all these different designations that mm -hmm. people, and I was, so I was reading some of the U.S. State Department's files that are, you can go and look at, that due to the Freedom of Information Act, you can just go and look at. And I was looking at all these emails from people in the aftermath going to and from President Obama, Hillary Clinton, different people in the White House and things like that, asking them what was the actual designation of this and what does that, and does that designation determine the level of security and why was the level of security not up to standard to repel mm -hmm. a, an attack? So were they, because they kept saying some stuff like they were unknown. Um, nobody knew where they were. 
uh, they weren't supposed to be there. Was it illegal so, that they were there? So that that is they're talking about the CIA annex itself. Okay, so not the other diplomatic. No, not place. the diplomatic. So that outpost. one was okay, but yeah, the CIA, I guess technically, should never be in another country, right? Because the, what they're doing is covert. Right. What they're you know, so they're technically not supposed to be there, but they're the CIA. So as you know. There's Russian spies in the U.S. <clears throat> There's whatever spies mm-hmm. in England. They don't follow the rules. They don't follow the rules. And mm-hmm. it's kind of, you know, this is kind of simplistic, but generally accepted that espionage is going to take place around the world. Right. And as a U.S. citizen, you know, the CIA gathering intelligence that can be used to protect U.S. lives and protect, you know, any attack on the homeland or mm-hmm. interests abroad, they're doing that work. Right, so they're they're there, but they're and it's got to be secret. Yeah, because it's covert. Mm-hmm. It's covert, and they're not, you know, like I said, not supposed to be there. But as it kind of says in the movie, and it says in the book, this annex is kind of like known, like people know it's there. Right. It's this big walled compound. There's white westerners that come out of it all the time. Mm-hmm. There's cameras and lights on it all the time. So it's kind of like not so secret. In Benghazi, that the yeah. CIA and base is there. Did they did they have satellite like imagery um, in two thousand and twelve like we do now? Yes. So so, yeah. so all of these you know um, all of the terrorists or whoever the Libyans that mm-hmm. didn't want them to be there could have had that imagery pretty much easily. Mm, that I don't I don't I don't think that Libya has any like. Spy satellites. You can just go onto Google Maps and you, you could and go- see the compound and see where all the buildings are. And- you, you could you could go onto Google Maps and see it if it wasn't blocked out because the CIA could go into Google Maps and block it out oh, at, at right, that time. Okay. But um, Google Maps also doesn't give you like a live feed. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's just it's just a, a, a picture. And like they said, this building used to be a prominent oil person's house or you know something along those lines. So these buildings were already there. But the locals knew that there was something going on in these buildings mm-hmm. that was not associated with "quote unquote" Libyan, you know, yeah. government and stuff like that. They knew it was. But also, um, there was another scene which made which I was just wondering about. Um, it was the one where the woman was. Ha- I think it was the first deal that she was having, and she mm-hmm. was like sat in a cafe, and it was when Jack had his first assignment with them. Right. Um, and they basically were like. We've got to get out of here because they saw that there were loads of people there that shouldn't that were watching them, mm-hmm. and they said we've got a tail. Right? Did they have a tail because people were trying to find this base, or did they already know that that base was there? Right. So they they kind of talk about they talk about that a couple different times. Um, they're what they're really worried. Yeah, they're, what they're worried about is people getting pictures of them and forwarding so that they're kind of get like on a list of the terrorists. The terrorists know who these people. You know who these people are right and then also yes following them back to their base so some people some people in benghazi will know where this is some Mm -hmm. people won't right but they are going to do their best to still try and keep it hidden to still try and keep it hidden right that that's you know i don't know all the ins and outs of cia tradecraft or you know who was taking pictures of them and stuff like that but that's generally what what that's what that's going to be um, so when we kind of, I guess now we can kind of get into the events of that night and, or we'll actually we'll go back a little bit further. So talking about the diplomatic outpost, it, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't have the security that's supposed to, because this is a temporary facility until an actual one, actual one can be built that will have all of the proper security and they explained that in the movie, didn't they? They do talk about that. Um, the, I guess the U.S. doesn't want to spend the money on a temporary base when they know that there's going to be a permanent one that is going to be built. Mm-hmm. Because and, and I say that because the State Department and the ambassador have both sent emails to D.C. requesting more security from personnel to facility type things to build up and, and make it more mm-hmm. secure, all of those are d- denied. And is that because the U.S. was under the illusion that it was quite Libya was safe to be in at that time? Like that chief seemed to you know, he said 
you know, we're safe here. This is a safe place. Um, I th- So I think it is them. I, I, I don't know exactly. But when I look at when I was reading the State Department files and some of the emails that were sent asking questions about this, they this D.C. raised the threat level in Benghazi basically to the criti- critical level. Mm-hmm. But then they also denied the further security upgrades and personnel upgrades right, that, okay. were, that were requested. So it's very, very confusing as to why they have identified Benghazi as a super dangerous place, but then they're not raising their security levels to meet the threat that they have mm-hmm. identified. And these emails are basically asking... They're, the email that I read directly to President Obama and Hillary Clinton asking them why they had identified the threat level as being so dangerous, but then refused several attempts by the ambassador and the State Department security men to deny them further security measures. And we may never know because of bureaucracy and political right. agenda and political So career. who was the president at the time in 2012? Obama. Obama. Okay. And so we'll talk more about that when we get to the aftermath and and things, but that will lead to its its own own problems uh, on the on the night of September 11th. But so we've identified that the the diplomatic outpost doesn't have the security measures that it sh- it should. Um, and they talk about that in the movie, right? The the GRS uh, guys go to there and they they say like, if anybody gets in here, y'all are all gonna die. Right? Y'all don't have enough. Y'all don't have any mm-hmm. heavy weapons. Y'all don't have the security measures. Y'all don't have enough people. Mm-hmm. All of those things. So they they know. And the, in in the movie, the State Department guys are kind of portrayed as not very the two those two secure the two kind of security guys and the IT guy. Are they the State Department people? Yeah, so the State Department, when I say State Department, I refer to the guys, the security element that's with the ambassador at mm, his... There's two guys, isn't it? There's, well, you really only see two, but there's there's five of them. There's five of them. Right, there. okay. Um, so there's there's two with the ambassador, and then there's three from uh, Tripoli that they brought along for extra, for extra security. Right, okay. Oh, one of them was in, like, the CCTV room, and... Yeah, yes, yeah. He, yeah, he's one of them. His name is Alex Hen- Alex mm-hmm. Henderson. Um, but so they they see they show this in the movie very quickly. But they show people on the rooftops of other buildings alongside the outpost, taking pictures mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, they knew that there was a that the security was not very not very strong strong there. So now we'll kind of get to the the start of the attack and the events of the attack on the outpost and the attack on the annex so at the the movie has 13 hours and so that is from the start of the attack to the very very end of when they leave libya from the airport the the next morning that's that's the 13 hours that that they're talking okay, about okay and that's accurate yes yeah okay so at nine, roughly 9.40 is when they start hearing chanting and gunshots outside of the consulate or where, where the where the ambassador is. Mm-hmm. And very, very quickly, you know, there's they say roughly 30 to 40 men rush the front gate. The Libyan security guards that are there flee and don't put up any type of a fight. The gate is basically open and they rush in. And very, very quickly overrun the entire area. And the State Department guys break off into three separate areas. You have Scott uh, Wickland, I think is his name. He is the guy who runs to the ambassador Mm -hmm. and gets the ambassador and Sean Smith, who's the uh, IT uh, specialist, into the safe haven in the villa. Then... In the movie, they only show one person, but in the book, there's two of the State Department guys that run to the talk, like the right. CCTV uh, room that you said. Okay. They run there so that they can observe through the cameras what is going on. And then you have another group, or uh, one guy, or two, excuse me, two guys go to what they call the cantina, which is where they 
eat and have some supplies and, and things like that. And so there's there's two State Department guys in the cantina and then one Libyan uh, security guard who ran in there to hide mm-hmm. to hide with them. And the terrorists quickly, they destroy some of the uh, cars that are there. They set fire to a bunch of stuff. They're shooting rounds all over the place and they're getting into the buildings. And so Scott Wickland and the ambassador and Sean Smith are in the safe haven of the villa. Alex Henderson is in the talk and he puts the call out very quickly to the annex, to Tripoli, and then that is relayed to Washington, D.C. So very, very quickly are the powers that be alerted that there's an attack going mm-hmm. on at the uh, where the ambassador is. The GRS operators are ready to go very shortly after that. And they're told to stand stand down by he's identified as Bob in the book. They call him Bob in the in the movie as well, but the CIA annex chief. Mm-hmm. And this is a point of this is a point of contention as to whether this stand down order actually happened or not. And it's only a point of contention to protect people's careers from the political side and the CIA side. Because all of the firsthand accounts from the GRS guys say that this was given multiple times and in multiple ways and verbatim the right. stand down order was given. Right. They have given testimony to the events of that night. And every single part of their testimony has been believed and uh, used in the official, you know, statements and everything Which like that. Which then doesn't make sense for it not to be believed that exactly that order was exactly. This is the not one made a hundred percent. This is the one piece of information that they're saying. Oh well, that may not have happened. Right. But you're believing everything else that these guys have said. They mm-hmm. have no ulterior motive other than to tell the truth about what happened that night. They're ready to go almost immediately. Why would they not? Why would they not have gone if the stand mm-hmm. if there some type of stand down order wasn't given to to them? Yeah, and they were obviously willing to go because that was voluntary, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's not like they were scared and delaying. No, definitely not. They, yeah, they had volunteered to go. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so the CIA chief has said in his statements that he never gave a stand down order whatsoever, and the, you know, Hillary Clinton and people in the White House protecting their political careers have said that, you know, oh, because they're trying to cover their rear ends because an ambassador died. Mm-hmm. And so if there was a, if there was no stand down, or if there was a stand down order, that would eventually come back to them saying, oh, why didn't you send them earlier? Mm-hmm. There's the two things that to me say that there was a stand down order is one, that the first-hand accounts of the men that were there saying there was a stand-down order, and two, the reaction time of the force of when they actually did go out. Yes. They would not have waited uh, otherwise. How, so how long was it until they actually did leave from the first, you know, first finding out about it? Yeah, so the the attack starts at 9.40, mm-hmm. and they, they eventually leave the compound a little bit after 10 o'clock. So roughly 30, 30, 40, you know, sometime in there. Oh, so minute. not too much longer. I thought it was hours. No, well, by. I mean, 30 to 40 minutes. Is a in, lot when that's a, all happening. When that's all happening yeah, is a yeah. ton of time. They're less than a mile away. You've got men that can respond immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, all of them, all of the men that were there in the interviews that I watched have said, if we were, if we were given the green light to go immediately when we were ready to go, the ambassador would be alive. Would be alive. Yes. And so would Sean Smith. Yes. And they say that in the movie as well, don't they? Yes. Yeah. So eventually they leave and they take... So there's there's one one thing that the movie doesn't necessarily get... They, I mean, they get it wrong because it, he's not there. But there's, in the book, there's one other GRS team member, and that is the team leader. He is kind of an overall command of the GRS team. I would look at him as like kind of like the officer and then the other guys as kind of like the enlisted men mm-hmm. of GRS. 
and he's not in the movie at all. And um, but but he is in, in the book, and he goes with them to the compound to kind of coordinate with the CIA and with the militia brigade that's called 17th Feb. Mm -hmm. Why and, did they take him out? Um, so the only reason that I can think of that they, they took him out is that maybe he still works there, and for privacy's uh, sake, they mm -hmm. left him out, or that he requested to not be in the movie, and they res respected that mm -hmm. for whatever for whatever reason. But he Not goes, to just simplify the storyline a bit. I mean, maybe so. Maybe that too. But either way, he is not in, in the movie. And he goes along to coordinate with information back to the base and to coordinate when they get in contact with the 17 Feb militia that is supposed to be friendly to them. And they're called the 17 February Martyrs Brigade because the Civil War against Gaddafi started on the 17th of February. And that's a kind of like a memorial to the people who died in the Civil War right. against Gaddafi. So anytime you hear 17 Feb, Feb 17, that's... But none of them have um, any uniform or anything to identify them. So nobody knows yeah, who nobody, they are. No, and you see that. In, in, and I think they portray that kind of confusion mm -hmm. and not being able to tell who's who very well yeah. in the movie. So they, they take off from the annex and head towards the the uh, ambassador's compound and from from this point in in the movie it's it's fairly accurate they get to a point where there's they run into a, a blockade on the street and they identify them as you know 17 feb and they start trying to coordinate this and that and then they, they come under fire and that is when they decide to break up into two groups and one's going to go towards the front gate. Mm -hmm. and the other one is going to try and get to mm -hmm. high ground in a building to have some overwatch for them. That doesn't work out, and they keep moving. Mm -hmm. And they run loads. And they run loads. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, they have the interpreter with them. In the movie, his name is Amal. In the book, his name is Henry. And I think they're just doing that to protect him because he's a Libyan citizen, and mm -hmm. they don't want it out out who who he is and so he was a real character yep he's a real character uh he goes he goes with them out to be able to interpret wow. uh for them and um wow. they did he end up doing much interpretation it didn't seem like he did so he does how necessary he was in the end so he he does he he talks to the 17 feb guys and helps identify them as 17 okay. feb because no one else no one else speaks arabic right that, that's there and uh, later on, in, when they're back at the annex, he's coordinating with the CIA guys to speak Arabic for them when they're trying to coordinate who's going to come and rescue okay. them or uh, all, right. all, of okay. those, all of those all of those types of things. So it was necessary that he was like, put at risk like that. Yeah, I think it's a good thing they, they mm -hmm. probably took him with him. But they they get into some they get into battle and they fight their way to the front gate. And then the other team, consisting of Tonto and Boone, and then they have two 17 Feb guys, those two young guys mm -hmm. who come up. They, they're they going around the back gate. Mm -hmm. And the entire time they're running past people, I mean, like guys are watching soccer games and guys yeah. are smoking hookah. Dodgy-looking people. Yeah, and, and they're, they're, they're like, running past some of the attackers. Are those are, bad guys? <laughs> yeah, they can't tell. Mm -hmm. It's completely chaotic. I Because it, the bad guys are somewhere at this point. A lot of the bad guys have actually left the compound, haven't they? Right. So, they, so they've lit it all on fire. They've lit it all on fire, and then they've they've dispersed. Mm -hmm. And they kind of talk about it in the movie. They do a lot of times. People will do that to bring more people in, so then they can have a second attack to get more, kill more, kill more. Right. Members. Okay. Um, at this point in time is when when the GRS team is moving to the front gate and the back gate is kind of when. The ambassador and Sean Smith get separated from Scott Wicklund. In the book, you, you hear it, you hear it just very quickly in the movie. But in the book, they're in the bathroom, and the smoke is starting to fill them up, mm -hmm. fill up the uh, the room. And so they realize that they have to move. And all of the windows are barred for security, so they can't just break a window mm -hmm. and get out. There's only certain points where they can. Mm -hmm. And so Scott Wicklund says, "Follow me." You just hear it very quickly in the movie. But then he starts to try and move to an area. He's air the IT guy, is he? No, that's Sean Smith. Scott Wicklund. Oh, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's the, the white guy with the mustache yes, who yes, is yes, the yes. kind of body bodyguard yes, for the ambassador. Sorry. When the, from that movement from the bathroom 
to the window where they can kind of get out onto a balcony and then onto the roof, they get separated. All three of them get get separated because of smoke. because of the smoke. And Scott Wickland breaks out of the window onto a balcony and then realizes that he doesn't have the ambassador or Sean Smith. Mm -hmm. He goes back in multiple times to try and search for them and cannot find them and is basically on the verge of collapsing because of smoke inhalation. Mm -hmm. So he goes to the top of the roof to basically hide and get air. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when the attackers, he shot at a little bit, but that's when the attackers kind of start to disperse. Mm -hmm. And then the other State Department guys come out of hiding and begin to consolidate and evaluate what has what has happened and so and this this also is how they think it happened yeah what actually happened yeah right the movie gets a few little things wrong of who is where in the state department area Mm -hmm. but more or less what they show in the movie is from what i can tell what happened Mm -hmm. so before the grs guys get into the compound the attackers have kind of left people (laughs) have started Filling into the compound, onlookers, 17 Feb guys, all, all sort looters, you know, all, all sorts of people, opportunistic type things. And the State Department guys are going into the villa to look for uh, the ambassador and Sean Smith. That's kind of when the GRS guys arrive on scene and start providing security and they go to the talk. And they uh, start getting all of the sensitive documents and items and equipment that are in there. And you see them do that. And they have those yellow bags that they're mm-hmm. carrying with all the equipment. And then they begin to help look for the ambassador as, as well while they're, some of them are providing security. Mm-hmm. And they find Sean Smith and they, they drag him out and he is already he's already died. Mm-hmm. They're about to start doing some... Medical. They try some medical things on him to resuscitate him and things like that, but it, he's he's already dead. So they they load him up into one of the cars, and then that's they they continue to look for for the ambassador. In the movie, we see Roan and Jack go into mm-hmm. the villa, and Roan, uh, his he can't see, he can't breathe, and he's kind of lost in there. And Jack's like, "Follow my voice, follow my voice." At, in actuality, that was Tig. Who was who was doing that? And in the movie, you you Tig, see Tig instead of both those guys. No, uh, so Roan Roan and Tig are the ones who go go oh, right, into okay. go into the villa to look. Now, I'm wrong. Jack is there and he's helping look and everything, but that event specifically is uh, Tig and and, okay. and Roan. And you see this throughout the movie because the movie has identified John Krasinski's character of Jack Silva as kind of like the main guy. Mm -hmm. And so you, all of the things that happen with the GRS operators, as far as I can tell, actually, actually, but he just takes on some more roles. He takes on some more roles because they, he's the main character Mm -hmm. in in the movie. And I don't mean to say that to downplay what he did, because although he wasn't doing some of the things that they portray in the movie, he was off doing something else. Whether that be providing security or searching another area of the Mm -hmm. building or, you know, on Overwatch on top of the roof. Uh, he, <coughs> so they they changed some of those things up for the movie. Right. That doesn't mean that he wasn't doing something. Around this time is when they think one of two things. One, they think the ambassador is already dead. Be- they can't find him because Sean Smith is dead and the Inferno is so incredibly unbearable. They can't, they can barely get into the building anymore because of the smoke and the fire. Mm-hmm. Or two, that he's been kidnapped and taken and he's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. So, they are preparing to go back to the annex now and they get the state department guys they load them up in the car and they tell them to go back to the annex and turn we see left. yeah we see this to tell uh, tell them to turn left and the the main reason there's two main reasons that they did that one the route that they normally take is to the right so he knows that normally that they're going to go right and then go around the block and mm-hmm. then come back around to the annex they want to change that up specifically so that people don't follow them and stuff like that. And then two, they saw a bunch of bad guys in the building down the road mm-hmm. to the right. Right. And so they're telling them, go left, go left, go left. Well, they go right anyways. Mm-hmm. And that scene, 
the scene where they're the guys are trying to get them to go into that building and yes, stuff like that. Yeah, they open up the gates. Yeah, that happens. And then the guys in the back of the car are like, no, like, but it's so confusing. How it, are, are they friendly or are they not? Yeah, I. It's confusing to me that they even considered going in that mm-hmm. building because I'm like, what are you doing? You just got shot at by That's all of these not guys. Where you're trying to get yeah, to. it's not where you're trying to get to. Um, eventually, they push through it. They're shot at. They Mazel Tov cocktails and RPGs, and they the cars that they're in are bulletproof and have these run flat tires. So. They are able to push through that area. Now, in the movie, there's a little bit of, like, a car chase scene and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's not quite as dramatic as that full-blown car chase Mm -hmm. all the way down. But they, I mean, other than that, it's pretty intense. They're in this car getting shot at and everything like that. And and they eventually make it back to the base. Amazing car. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. uh, uh, I, I mean, like, they're point blank shooting AK rounds at the mm-hmm. at this car and you're just in there and you can't roll down the windows and shoot back because they're bulletproof windows so they don't yes, go down. Yeah. Um not that you would want to. <laughs> but any anyways. That's when there's a second attack on the out of the diplomatic outpost compound whatever you want to call it. And the GRS guys are on top of the building and some of them are at the top, some of them are at the bottom, but they're basically trying to fight them off so that they can consolidate and then leave. They, they fight off that, that, that second wave, and then they load up in the cars, and then they head back to the CIA annex. And they know that the annex is going to be hit next. Mm-hmm. Because, like we said earlier, it's not so secret CIA, CIA mm-hmm. base. What? Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, that it comes down to that main question as to why they were attacked to begin with. And I guess... So they're just guess they didn't really know why they were being attacked, but it would just make sense for them to, if they're attacking that embassy, then they're going to attack the other place. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Like we'll, when we kind of get to the aftermath, we'll talk about mm-hmm. all the reasons why. So we'll, we'll we will get to that, but they're just using logic right now. Yeah, they're like, hey, pretty much everyone knows we've got this CIA annex Westerner building down the road. They just attacked this one. They're going to attack us next. Yeah. And it's going to be much easier to defend ourselves at the annex than if we stay here. Mm-hmm. So they all go back to the annex and start preparing the defenses of the annex. And that is kind of when, well, a little bit before, is when the drone comes overhead. And this is kind of when you start seeing the U.S. government fig- trying to figure out what's going on and what their response is going to be, and if they're going to send military assets and things like that. All during this time, the Tripoli, the GRS team mm-hmm. in Tripoli, is getting ready to to come. Mm-hmm. And they commandeer a plane, they pay an oil baron like thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 and they force him to fly to Benghazi. Mm-hmm. They get two Delt- actual Delta Force operators to join them so you've got i think there's three or four triple e grs men Mm -hmm. plus two uh delta force operators what does grs stand for global response staff right and grs so this is one of the things that uh i initially got wrong and that um boone contacted Mm -hmm. me about one of the things i got wrong on one of my posts on instagram i said that grs was a private contractor that worked with the cia and they are actually a group within the CIA. Right. So they're not, for those who know you, they're not like Blackwater or Triple Canopy or these other kind of private contracting groups. They are a security element within the CIA. Right, okay. And they're stationed all all over the place where, this, where the CIA is. So these guys um, have, a lot of them have been... In Iraq with the CIA or Afghanistan with the CIA. Mm-hmm. Some of them have been in Libya before. And so Boone and uh, not Boone, sorry, um, uh, Roan and Jack had mm-hmm. previously worked together on one of these GRS postings somewhere, or so, how did they know each other? So that I'm not exactly sure sure of. I'd have to go back and look. I just can't remember. They know each other from their time in the Navy SEALs. Ah, uh, okay. So Jack and Roan are both former Navy SEALs. Right. And you've got Oz, T, 
Tig and Boone, who are all former Marines, and then Tonto is an Army Ranger. So they all come from different different military mm-hmm. backgrounds, and now they're they're working for for, right. for GRS. So you see this in the movie. You know they say like uh, POTUS, which is President of the United States. POTUS is about to be briefed, and some military generals talking about, "Oh, I just learned we had a CIA annex with you know this down the road, and w- where are our air assets, and you know in Italy and and uh, so Africom, which is the U.S. Africa Command." is in Djibouti, Mm -hmm. which is like two or 3,000 miles away. I thought I heard them mention Djibouti. Right. So they are sent... AFRICOM doesn't have the ability to respond. So the command has to transfer to European command, which is in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And then... Because they're over the bases in Italy and Spain and things like that. And military assets do prepare to respond. And we'll get into that here in a little bit, but the pro one of the problems that they run into is that if they send any assets, i.e., military personnel, it's going to take them longer to get there than the the events are going to unfold on the ground. Mm-hmm. So, what can they do now to help? And think and it's a massive debacle. But um, I mean, I like I. You know, in the movie, they're constantly requesting some air, air mm-hmm. power and things like that, and we'll dig into it more. But it's it's basically all denied for various reasons that are given of out of fueling range, not ready to go, th- th- things of that nature, mm-hmm. and it like none of that makes sense to me right. for any reason. I mean, they have a they have a drone overhead that that could make it there. I've never I I'm not saying that every single plane on the tarmac for the Air Force or the Navy or Marines is ready to go 100% of the time. But I know that there is some type of quick reaction air yeah. power force that is ready to go at all times. I mean, I, I looked at some all... Some means is to get them ready to go. Yes. I mean, they can do it quick if they yeah. have to. Um, I mean, I, I just did some quick quick math over the types of planes in the certain areas and the distance uh, and the time it would take these planes to get there and how much time that they would have on uh, the you know premise of the area before they would have to turn around and come back. And just very quick math shows that they could have responded. Yeah. And they could have responded multiple times with multiple different aircraft. Um, and, they, and they didn't. Mm-hmm. And they didn't. And we'll get into why later. So the guys fly into Benghazi Airport. Yeah. And so they're... The Tripoli team flies into the Benghazi, uh, an airport in, in Benghazi. Mm-hmm. And then... And you see this in the movie, the kind of bureaucracy of what, how are they going to get there? Transported to transported the to them, and who's going to lead? Base. They're there for a few hours trying to figure mm-hmm. this all out, while the people at the annex are fighting, fighting for their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so they get back to the annex around eleven thirty. All, all of mm-hmm. the, the GRS and the State Department guys, and then around twelve thirty is when you see the first attack. Right. On okay. on the annex and Oz, who, uh, his name is Mark Geist. Mm-hmm. He was out with that CIA case officer, so he was not. He did not go with them yes, to. He, so the, he had gone back to the annex before the other guys right, had done. Yeah. Right. So he begins preparing the defenses and bringing ammo mm-hmm. up onto the roofs and, and and getting rallying the troops that are there and putting them in in different spots to pro- provide security for the annex. Mm-hmm. Then they all come back. And they start preparing for what they believe to be the next attack. Around 1230 is when they see people massing all across the field what they call zo- zombie land. Mm-hmm. And a large number of men start moving across the field. And they're, you know, you, you see this in the movie. And they're, don't shoot until you see a weapon. and Because they don't want to do anything that's going to cause, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, be illegal mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And no one wears a uniform, so it's always hard to tell. But very, very quickly, and deep down, huge weapons that they're carrying. Yeah, they're all carrying AKs and, and RPGs mm-hmm. and, and things like that. Um, the first attack commences, and the GRS operators and then the remaining kind of staff of the CIA. Some of them have had prior military experience, and they're all in different positions. Um, and they kind of say this in the movie, but like 
they kind of kicked their ass on the first. Uh, Who kicks whose ass? The GRS guys, the, the CIA annex beats this first attack back. Right. Because, and they kind of say, they think that they're walking into another, they're just going to go in, storm it, mm-hmm. kill some more Americans. But this one's a lot more secure. This one's a lot more secure. And, and ready. And yeah, and, and the men there are much more, much more capable. Mm-hmm. And they, they're trying to breach the walls with RPGs and there's some um, man-made explode, you know, explosive devices that they chunk over the walls and things like that um but they are they are beaten back and the movie does a a great job of um filming this fight scene from what i've read read in the book and the little things that each of the men are doing from them from the the communication that they say Mm -hmm. is the same in the book and what they do before the battle starts, i.e. marking each of the men with the IR light on their rifles, and you see that green beam that goes mm-hmm. out, and identifying them, sectors of fire, people covering different areas so they don't get flanked. So what is that green beam? Was it UV? What was the... So it's IR, infrared. IR, infrared, okay. It's yeah. the same one that they used when the um, Delta Triple E guys were coming. To try and show them where the base was because right. they so, they were lost. Right, so that's called lassoing. Lassoing. Yeah, yes, and they say that it. in the movie. Yeah. But if you if say they're trying to find somebody, mm-hmm. and you've got nods which are IR, mm-hmm. and um, you have that on your weapon, you can lasso it like I've this. I've never seen that before. And I've then they say, oh, we we can see it. So do you think they did that? Yes, in they real did. Life? They did. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And so the first tack is beaten back, then. Between like one o'clock and one thirty is the is the second second attack on on the annex, and you start seeing f- different tactics that come at them from a different kind of area. Some of them still come from that same area, um, but in the movie you see this big big bus with mm-hmm. the with the bomb on it, mm-hmm. and when I was reading the book. They didn't talk about that, and so that's one of the things that I asked Dave specifically. I said, "Hey, I didn't see this in the book, but did did this happen?" And he said that there were multiple attempts with large amounts of ordnance to try and breach the walls, but no, they did not load it up in a school bus to mm-hmm. try and ram it or carry whatever they were doing. So he's saying, in essence, yes, that that it was real that them using large ordinance to try and blow up the walls but not the way it happened right. not the way it happened in the movie so they beat back the second attack and now they're starting to realize that there's no air support there's no u.s forces coming they're they're all, they're on their own and they know that if any real force comes at them with heavy weapons i.e mortars or heavy heavy uh, machine guns and, and things of that nature they're not gonna be able to hold them off for, for very for very long. Mm-hmm. Then, around 1.30 is when the Tripoli team finally makes it mm-hmm. to the... Um, or excuse me. I misspoke. Uh, 1.30 is when the Tripoli team arrives at the Benghazi airport. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, the, the Tripoli team arrives at the annex around between like five and five thirty some somewhere ar- ar- around there so they're there all night you know the sun is about to start com- coming up and they realize that they don't have enough trucks they don't have enough there's too many people there to get them to the airports they're gonna have to do multiple mm-hmm. trips so the grs guys are gonna have to hold down the fort a little bit longer mm-hmm. not long after that is when the third attack on the annex happens and this is when they uh Hear, hear the mortar fire. And... Mortar fire is... Mortar is the that big tube that they have. Oh, and they, yes. And you hear what's his name? Um, Tonto. Tonto saying, what was that noise? Yes. And so that yeah. they, 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 that scene's in the book as well, where their ears are basically blown out. None mm-hmm. of them have any uh, ear pro in or anything mm-hmm. like that. And so he comes up, he hears a noise, and he's actually asking. He's not saying like, oh, that's a mortar. He's saying, is that a mortar? Because... It's, he can't he can barely hear right. anything anymore right. and the mortar makes a very distinctive noise like it's kind of like a thunk mm-hmm. noise mm-hmm. and so he's actually putting it out on the radio like for confirmation of anybody else did y'all hear that 
was that a was that a mortar and, and it was and before that you saw the that car pull up with the phone and then the draw drive away yes and that was to get a location yeah get location get coordinates so that they can dial in these mortars and, and things like that right okay and the the triple e team is there now and then the mortar fire starts coming and then there's another attack as well so they're fighting back this third wave of attackers while under direct mortar fire or in you know indirect mortar fire so building c is where roan dave ubin who's one of the state department guys oz and glenn who is the leader of the triple e uh grs team are okay what time is this roughly it was around 5 30 in the morning okay and I think the, the most of the mortar fire is concentrated on building C because that's where the heavy machine gun is, which Roan is is on. Mm-hmm. And all the mortar fire is directed to, more or less towards them. I don't know how many mortar rounds were fired, but most of it's directed towards them. And the fir- one of the, the one of the first mortars lands outside the wall and they are, you can see that it's called walking it in. Mm-hmm. So they're they're seeing where their rounds land, mm-hmm. and then they're adjusting the tube, right, firing okay. another round. They're just going to get closer and closer. Cl- exactly. The next round hits the building and wounds Dave Ubin. The next round hits and uh, wounds Oz. Nearly takes his arm off. And nearly takes his arm off, mm-hmm. yes. Another round hits and kills Roan, mm-hmm. and then another round hits and kills, kills Glenn. Right. Around this time, is they kind of beat off the attack, or the attack is called off, and the attackers retreat. And then Tig and the two Delta Force operators go on, on top of the building. In the movie, Jack is up there. Mm-hmm. It was kind of another thing that they mm-hmm. they bring him over there. There's He wouldn't be there for a multitude of reasons. One, he was on another building. They don't know if they're going to get hit again. He has a sector to cover. Mm-hmm. He's a trained military professional. He's not going to abandon his his post mm-hmm. to go and, right. and check until they know the until they know the battle is secure. So other people go up there on the building, and Tig sees that Dave Ubin is badly wounded, and he's calling for medical help on on the roof. And they do, they say this in the movie that. So Roan is a registered nurse and a medical professional, and the, his entire time there, he's taught people about medical and given classes on on things. And so o- all over the radio, they say, "Roan, you know, we need medical help on, right, on the okay. roof." And then that's when so they. So that's why he's there. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's not the only reason he's there. Right. But um. But then they say, he Roan's gone. Roan's not here. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. Okay. In this last attack, they had two majorly wounded and two killed from from mortar fire. And this is after this is the last attack. And I mean, they don't know that, but this is kind of when they start to consolidate and get things ready, and then start their exfil to to the airport. And they go to the airport and they load up. The hang, hang on, what, at what point? Um, when there were a whole bunch of people that arrived and Tonto was like trying to work out, are you friendly? Are you? Mm-hmm. Um, when does that happen? That that's ha- before so they go to the airport. That's it? before they go to the airport. So before the mortar attack, the peop- the Libyan escort that helped the Tripoli team get to yes. the annex, they leave. Right. And. Um, and we'll talk about why in, in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, then the, the, the mortar attack happens, and then they either come back or more people come back to help ex- ex- exfil yeah. them out. Okay. So then they get to the airport. The CIA staff and the wounded members get on that plane, and they take off to Tripoli. Mm-hmm. And then the GRS guys and the delta force the two delta force guys wait with the bodies until another plane arrives 
they load up, and then they fly out to to Tripoli mm-hmm. as well. And that is around like ten forty, okay. some something like that. So that's the end of the the thir- the thirteen right. hours. Yeah. So, uh, when we get into the now, we can kind of get into the the aftermath and the the why and who of who did the attack mm-hmm. and and things like that and those questions started coming out immediately after there's a whole investigation by the US state department and congress into the these attacks and Hillary Clinton ends up having to step down as secretary of state and is as a result of this yes as a result oh, of this okay and there's so much confusion that for basically to protect political careers, mm-hmm. you have the election uh, coming up and Obama doesn't want to present himself as a weak president because this, you know, everything would come back to the president, mm-hmm. you know, and so they try and down, in my opinion, they try and downplay everything about the attack from who did it to why they did it to the response the u.s government gave to them mm-hmm. all all of these types of things and the they they claim that the reason for the attack was a spontaneous protest for this youtube video called the innocence of muslims and the innocence of muslims is a youtube video that came out that i I have not. I've only watched part of it because it's very badly done, but it basically is making fun of Muhammad and Islam and stuff like that. And there were some protests of this mm-hmm. video in Egypt, but there were not in Benghazi, and there were not that night. And we know now from actual facts and intelligence that we'll get to here in just a second that it has no it had no bearing mm-hmm. on on the attack. But that's what the U.S. That's what Hillary Clinton said. That's what President Obama said. You know, President Obama even refused to call this a terrorist attack. He called it an act of terror. And all, all these things. This is all just... P- Isn't poli- that the same thing? No. Oh. Uh, no. It is not. Obama's already kind of under scrutiny for his involvement within the NATO and UN response to the Libyan civil war. Because he acted unilaterally on his own in committing U.S. troops to that fight without the approval of Congress, which is against the Constitution. Mm-hmm. And he's claiming that, you know, under wartime powers and all these. So there's already controversy within him, with him, or surrounding him due to Libya. And I think he's trying to downplay these things so that it kind of goes away for, for the next election. Um, but. Now, yeah, so now we'll dig into the who and the why. And the information on who and why these attacks happen comes from um, the book Benghazi, Know Thy Enemy, A Cold Case Investigation. And this book was written by uh, Sarah Adams and Dave Benton, who Dave Benton, it goes by Boone, Mm -hmm. was one of the men there that night. And Sarah Adams was a CIA case officer who was in Benghazi and had left that morning before the attack to go on another assignment. They had worked extensively in Libya and Afghanistan. And Dave had worked with the CIA on multiple things. I was reading in the book, it said that he had worked with the CIA and helping track down the location of Osama bin Laden. And so this book comes from two authorities of this event Mm -hmm. and over a decade worth of them investigating and finding sources and intelligence as to who the attackers were and why why they did what they did and the information that they have is that the attack on the u.s diplomatic outpost where the ambassador is and the attack on the annex were done by two different groups of people and so we'll start with the attack uh, at the ambassador's location and this was done by a terrorist group called AQIM and that's the uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maharab and that is they're out of Algeria and they are kind of an Al-Qaeda affiliate within North Africa they specialize 
and kidnap and ransom. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, well, we'll get to the annex in a second. So do you think their their intent was to kidnap the ambassador? That is exactly what their intent was. Right. And so their intent was to kidnap Ambassador Stevens and then ransom him to let other the U.S. to release other terrorists that have that were been arrested uh, for various things involving the Arab Spring revolts and riots and 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 those types of things. Uh, this was planned. I'm gonna. I'm always so terrible with, with names, but the the leader of Al, Al Qaeda at this time was Zawari, and he planned this attack specifically in Libya for the death of his kind of lieutenant or second in command was uh, Abu al Libi, and it was planned and funded by Al Qaeda. They're kind of operating out of the tribal lands in Pakistan mm -hmm. area, and they are trying to get a foothold in Libya because Gaddafi's been kicked out, everything's chaotic, and they haven't fully established al-Qaeda in Libya. So they're going to use their affiliate partners that are already in North Africa to plan and carry out this attack. And the man behind the ambassador attack and attempted kidnapping was Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar. He's one of the, not the head, but one of the battalion leaders for AQIM in Algeria and operating within, within North Africa. So right now we have evidence of why this attack happened. Mm -hmm. It was not a YouTube protest, mm -hmm. spontaneous riot that turned into an attack on a U.S. ambassador. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading the State Department files... There was evidence coming out by like, I can't remember, it was like October, November, December of 2012 that there was some Al-Qaeda affiliation with this this attack. And the story that Hillary Clinton and other people were telling about this YouTube video doesn't line up with any of the accounts of the men that were there that night. Mm -hmm. the there were no spontaneous riots. There were no people protesting in the streets. It was a planned, coordinated attack. On a U.S. on a U.S. to kidnap a U.S. Yeah, ambassador. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it can't have been a coincidence that it happened when the the ambassador was there. No, it was all it was all planned. Mm -hmm. It was all planned, and then that brings us to the attack on the annex, and this was carried out by a local militia, Libyan militia called the Libya Shield One, and after Gaddafi's fall, Libya has a bunch of these kind of private-esque militias pop up to help control the different areas while the new government kind of gets settled in, more or less. And Libya Shield 1 is one of the state-funded and sponsored militias. So they, they have the backing of the Libyan government behind them. And they are the ones that attack the annex. And from what they have found, that this Libyan Shield 1 militia was given information by AQIM and by Al-Qaeda, and they were coordinating together these attacks, and so they knew what the other one was doing. It was not mm -hmm. just a spontaneous attack on the annex either. Why didn't they do them at the same time, then, if they were two different groups of people? I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I haven't finished the book. Maybe uh, I just started it. So maybe that information... I mean, mm -hmm. this what I just talked about is very basic information for, for the podcast, but... The book goes into much, much more detail. Okay, because in the movie, it, it kind of suggests that it's the same group, doesn't it? Because you see some of those same key guys with the long hair. Right, and... so also the movie itself, this book came out after... So they, they didn't know. They didn't know, yeah. or they knew little. And I guess that's why you don't really get any names or anything of any of the um, attackers. attackers. And things. Right. Yeah. That book, this book identifies those men... And is calling the U.S. to bring these men to justice, which they have not done to this day. Mm -hmm. um, the leader of the Libyan shield that attacked the annex was Hussam bin Hamid, And they identify him and identify a bunch of the other attackers um, on the annex and the outpost. So the U.S. response is basically been, it, it was nothing during the attack. And it's been nothing, nothing after. after the attack. Wow. Um, and that is all to protect political careers and CIA careers, um, which is really sad because 
people lost their lives in this attack Mm -hmm. and their families deserve to have one the truth told to them Mm -hmm. and two justice for Mm -hmm. their family members that died defending Mm -hmm. u.s interests in in libya now what whether your politics align with whether or not the u.s should be intervening or doing stuff in libya it doesn't matter as soon as an attack attack happens Mm -hmm. and these terrorist organizations have no affiliation and no protection and if we're going to go out and say that we're against terrorism and stuff like that, but then because this hurts some election in the U S not go out and do anything because it doesn't, it's going to make us look bad. It's yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. It's, 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 it's terrible. Um, anyway, that kind of, I mean, that's, you know, I wish we could dive more and more into all of it and everything like that. But for podcast sake, that covers, um, that, that, that covers, that covers a lot. Um, I'd like to watch it again now, knowing all of this information. It it changes it mm-hmm. when you, especially the stuff from Dave and his book, uh, you know, the Beng- the Benghazi mm-hmm. Know Thy Enemy book. Knowing these things and knowing these actual terrorist players, mm-hmm. when you you know, because I I had obviously talked to him and read some of the book before we we watched it again for for the podcast. I'm watching it again, knowing these things, and it just. It makes me angry at the politicians who hide behind their status and power to, um, yeah. Yeah, but I guess that that's the way, isn't it? And it's always been the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, from the start. Mm-hmm. From the start. Um, but I think the movie does a very good job portraying the heroism of these men and women mm-hmm. that night in, yeah. in Benghazi. I think the way it was filmed was done very very well Mm -hmm. the men themselves the actors that portray these men i know spoke to the the actual men the grs operators and their to their families and from the interviews that i've watched of the actual men uh talking about the movie they are proud that this how this movie tells their story and they're proud what about um scott um, Wick, what, what's his name? Scott Wickland. Scott, Wick, Scott Wickland. What about he was him? Probably the only one that sort of like maybe came across as a bit like not so heroic. He did come across as heroic, but right. also very much like he was freaking out. I wonder how he feels about that. Yeah, and when I read the book, I get a little sense of him being a little bit more to with it. Right. Okay. During the events of the night, Mrs. The was who what his role was. He was the state, one of the state security mm-hmm. guys, yes. wasn't he? With the dark hair and the mustache. Yes, um, but it is evident that the state guys are not up to the same level mm-hmm. as the GRS guys. Um, they're mm-hmm. over, and their response shows that. Right. right. They're they don't have the same level of security. They don't have the same level of training. The way they respond to things is different. Um, so I don't want to hit them. I don't want to just bash on them because it's a, an intense situation that they were in. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're just not up. And that's one of the reasons why GRS is there. And, and, and you mm-hmm. see them able to respond to these same situations in very different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, little things about the movie. They get little things wrong here and there. Like, like I said, mainly revolving around around Jack and what Jack does. Like at the beginning of the movie, when Jack arrives in Libya and they're in that Defender and they get stopped by that militia and they have to like talk their way out and they mm-hmm. got the guns out and stuff like that. That happened a few weeks prior, and I can't remember who okay. was. It did happen, and Roan was there and he had to talk his way out of it, mm-hmm. and it was a pretty intense situation. Jack just wasn't there. But I don't like that scene, and I don't. The book doesn't go into detail about it all that much, but. They're at this checkpoint, and they've got guys with AKs and heavy machine guns pointing at them. And what do they what do they do? They pull out their pistols mm-hmm. and they stick them out like this. And they're like they do it all weird. Like one's one's got his across his body, and the other one's sticking it across. And the mm-hmm. guns are making cocking sounds, which is all after post production. Guns don't mm-hmm. make cocking sounds every time you mm-hmm. move them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, 
there's a guy with an AK pointing at you, and you just pulled a pistol and pointed and pointed it at him. Mm-hmm. I mean, like if if I was carrying an AK and I see somebody pulling a gun, I'm, I'm shooting. I'm shooting them. Yeah. So I'm not saying that they didn't pull their guns. I'm just saying the way it was filmed in the movie. It was. It came across. But a little, did but, but did he say that he actually did say that they had like yes, eyes yeah, in bl- the air and he bluffed his bluffed his way wow, out of it. Goodness, yeah, which is extremely Terror, intense. Terrifying. Yeah, it would I be... would not be good in that job. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was when I was doing some Instagram posts and uh, you know I kind of try and highlight each of the members of GRS and kind of a little bit of background and mm-hmm. what they did, and I posted one of, of Jack, and uh, Dave messaged me. And say so he goes, the picture that you have is the is the picture of the real Jack Silva, but his real name is not Jack Silva. You will never know his real name. Oh, how cool! You will never, you. you will never know anything about right about Jack, ever. Because in the book, he has uh, two sons. Mm-hmm. In the movie, he's got three daughters. Or something. Yeah, two daughters and and, and, and pregnant. Way. Pregnant. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so who knows if if either of those are correct. Mm-hmm. Right, we you know we, we won't ever know his real name. He, and his he, wife having a breakdown. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that that information may be true about yeah. them. You know, in the and telling him that she's pregnant and, and mm-hmm. everything like that. Um, but uh, I know that John Krasinski met, I think, with the real Jack Silva to oh, really? talk to him, and and I know that um, James Badge Dale met with Tyrone Woods, his family, and. Uh, beforehand to pay respect to them and to make sure they got it right and so the the movie did a lot a lot to make sure that they portrayed how heroic these men were but then accurately portray what they actually right. what they actually went through on on, on that night um so I, yeah the, i have little things about the movie oh they didn't do this quite right mm-hmm. or this was wrong or w- whatever it may be but overall I really like the movie, and I think they did a. I think they did a, a, a great, great who job. Who directed it? Uh, Michael Bay. And what else has he? He done? Michael Bay did uh, the Transformers movies, mm-hmm. and I think he did Armageddon. Okay. Um, so he's known for his big explosions mm-hmm. and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's so a lot of his movies have military in them and, and things like that. And so he has relationships with these men. So bringing him in to do this movie, I think was a good a, a good thing. It, um, he has those relationships to know that they pe- the military side can trust him to tell their story accurately mm-hmm. or as as accurately as as possible, um, and 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 things of that nature. But uh, overall, I like the movie. Um, yeah, what are some of your closing closing thoughts on the from the movie and the actual story, and now knowing a little bit more about it? Anything specific or any other questions that you have? I don't know. I just, I, I think it was great. A really good movie. And I think this has been, I've really enjoyed recording this and learning everything about it. So I think I'm going to try and tell all my friends about it and get them to watch it and well, get listen. Them to, because, yeah, I was like, get them to listen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> get them to watch it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, listen because it's been really interesting. It, it's extremely interesting because it's it's almost like conspiracy levels in the U.S. government of their mm-hmm. response and things like that, and so you feel like you're learning and from new information anytime you dig into something about this event because it's all been cloak and dagger and covered up, mm-hmm. you know, and and so you can you see the movie and you're like, oh wow, this is intense and these these you know these men fought this battle and 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 some of them survived and some of them didn't but then you learn the kind of the backstory and some of the other information like oh my goodness this changes yeah it changes uh, all of it um yeah not gonna not gonna do it for us you think i think so yeah well thank you all for listening and um check us out on instagram check us out on spotify wherever you listen to your podcasts tell everybody you know uh, we appreciate it and uh, hopefully it won't be too, too long uh, before we get the, the next episode out for y'all. So thank you very much. Adios. Bye.